nonetheless, you're right. You're in this situation where you're sitting across from the president of the United States. And I think it's important when you go into those situations to realize it's not really you. You're not there because of, I'm not, I wasn't there because I'm Mike Hurley, whatever weight that would carry. I was there because I was representing the American people. And when you think about it, it's pretty awe-inspiring. Hi, I'm Mike Hurley. I'm Barbara Gruy. We're the hosts of the Are We Safer Today podcast. In this podcast, we speak with members of the 9-11 Commission staff about their unique experiences in the investigation into the 9-11 attacks. The 9-11 Commission was chartered by Congress to investigate the most significant attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor. Supporting the work of the commissioners, the Commission's staff was tasked with reconstructing a complex jigsaw puzzle. What led to 9-11? What happened on that day? What should we do about it? But unlike a typical jigsaw puzzle, the pieces were not in a box. There was no image of what the solved puzzle would look like, and many of the pieces were missing. I'm Barbara Gruy. I'm Mike Hurley, and this is the Are We Safer Today podcast. Before we jump into our interviews with our former colleagues, we will start with our own personal perspectives about working on the 9-11 staff. Mike and his team's piece of the puzzle involved investigating CIA covert action directed at al-Qaeda. They also investigated the National Security Council and the Pentagon's decision-making, as well as both the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. Michael's team investigated some of the most sensitive counterterrorism programs, the crown jewels of American intelligence. Michael is my co-host of the Are We Safer Today podcast, and you will soon learn why he's the perfect person to not only tell the stories of our colleagues, but was also uniquely qualified to solve the puzzles Team 3 faced. We would like to thank our sponsor, Carnegie Corporation of New York. The philanthropic foundation supports innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. Learn more at carnegie.org and the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. Mike, let's start with your role on the commission staff. What did your role really involve as part of the staff? I was a senior counsel and team leader. There were nine different teams on the 9-11 Commission, and I was the team leader of one of them. That was my role, and to sort of guide the work of that team. And the focus of our team, our portfolio, was the counterterrorism policy investigation. So, so what does that really mean? A policy is, is a principle, a guiding principle, decisions that the government makes to respond to a particular set of issues. And counterterrorism policy was the policy of the U.S. government, in our case that we were investigating across two administrations, the Bill Clinton administration and the George W. Bush administration. How each of those administrations had responded to the rising threat of al-Qaeda during those years. That's what we needed to investigate to see what measures that all the different agencies of the U.S. government involved in national security had taken against al-Qaeda to combat al-Qaeda and to try to eliminate that threat. I mean, how daunting was it that that's what you had to focus on and your team focus on as part of the commission? I think it was pretty daunting, actually, because so many facets of the 9-11 Commission's investigation were intensely uh, interesting to the public. On that particular question, there was maybe special interest. And that was because the public, and I'd say particularly the families of the victims of 9-11, who had become very involved in the creation of the commission and in supporting it all the way along, were kind of looking for who would the 9-11 commission blame for the 9-11 attacks? Would it be President Clinton? Would it be President Bush? That's sort of what was, I think, in the public's mind. And so there was intense focus on that. And so trying to find out what the story was uh, was was really central to it. And it I think it created sort of that sense of pressure. and and it was it was a daunting challenge. Of course, what the public didn't really know was that was not the purpose of the commission to assign blame to presidents or anyone else. The purpose was to investigate the facts and circumstances surrounding the attacks 
and to lay out the facts of what we discovered. And then Congress and the American people could make a decision as to who had acted in the right way, who had made mistakes, and so on. But it certainly made what we were doing complicated, I think. You know, you're a former CIA officer. You had spent time after the 9-11 attacks in Afghanistan looking for bin Laden. What was your role and your time in Afghanistan? I was one of the senior people uh, from the agency that was sent out to Afghanistan in the fall of 2001. The CIA had its first team on the ground two weeks after the 9-11 attacks. There were seven teams, all in strategic parts of Afghanistan, whose job was to unite and work closely with friendly Afghan militias. Most of them had uh, U.S. Special Forces, a team of Green Berets assigned with them to develop intelligence to find and locate where al-Qaeda and the Taliban were located in Afghanistan and then to capture them or, or kill them. That was our mission. We also had the mission of finding out the location of what were called high-value targets. That meant Osama bin Laden and his top lieutenants, Ayman al-Zawahiri, the number two of al-Qaeda, Mullah Omar, the head of the Taliban as well, too. So that, that's really what our mission was. And to do that, we had to develop sources in the regions of the country that we were located in. So I arrived in Kabul and I was immediately sent down to Gardez, which was in southeastern Afghanistan, pretty close to the Pakistani border. And then I was involved in winter of 2002 with what became the biggest battle at that point of our involvement in Afghanistan called Operation Anaconda. So my team was directly involved in that, but it was essentially trying to develop information on where, on where the enemy was. Because of this experience in Afghanistan, particularly looking for these high-value targets, did you sort of think that your experience on the commission had much more of a personal aspect to it, a personal interest in what the commission was doing? I was really interested to find out for myself in the investigation about how our government had responded to the growing threat of al-Qaeda, mistakes that were made so we could learn from them. I think the tradition at the CIA and in the military particularly when there's a failure, it's to address it honestly and to come up with lessons learned and to try to, to learn something from it so that you can avoid those, those same problems in the future. So I think that was part of it. My background in the agency I think was also useful in some ways for the commission because that background was helpful in relations with families of the victims of 9-11 to know that the commission had somebody on it that had actually been out on the ground fighting the enemy that had you know, caused such terrible tragedies for, for their families. That was part of it. And I actually remember a year or so later when my team was, um, was involved in one of the public hearings of the top policymakers of both the Clinton and Bush administrations that I was tapped to read one of the staff statements as I did that, the CNN and the other you know, cable networks had a chyron underneath me identifying who I was, and it said, and served three tours in Afghanistan. So I think that you know, added a slight degree of credibility as well, too. You know, your background in the CIA, so you certainly knew you know, where the bodies were buried, so to speak, where the secrets were kept and how to find them. But you also had the work on the National Security Council, which was really a different kind of perspective. Did those two things sort of put together uniquely position you to do the work of Team 3 looking at the counterterrorism policy? I think I combine that sort of uh, boots on the ground experience with the policy side in Washington, D.C. Although when I was on the NSC, I wasn't working on Afghanistan or terrorism. I was working on the, the Balkans crisis of the late 90s. But I think, I think my experience in CIA particularly, especially being in a place like Afghanistan where you're working with small teams, you're under intense pressure. And there was time pressure as well, too, to get your work done, to develop the intelligence on where uh, bin Laden or others were, were located. And you had to work cohesively. I was pretty familiar with working with CIA employees. But we work side by side with U.S. Special Forces, with Navy SEALs and Delta Force, and also with British Special Air Service and British Special Boat Service. 
and other nationalities as well, too, that were there helping us. So forging all of that into a cohesive unit to have a common approaches and trying to get to specific agreed-on goals, I think some of those lessons carried over pretty directly to the 9-11 Commission as well, too, because we had to form together as a team people with different backgrounds, and we were under very, very tight time pressure to conduct our investigation. Well, I think the other aspect of it was you had such deep government experience, but much of your team, although highly educated and very capable in their fields, such as historians, weren't steeped in how the government works. So was that background that you had important in helping your team understand how to do what they were being tasked for the commission, which was different from what their normal area of expertise was. I could provide them a lot of guidance on that, and you really identified a distinctive aspect of my team. So many of the other teams of the 9-11 Commission brought in pretty deeply experienced people from different parts of the government, from Department of Justice, Barbara, which you're so familiar with, but also from the military, for example, and also from the FBI and law enforcement as well, too. And they were pretty seasoned people, veterans that had deep experience. What I had were incredibly brilliant young people who, in a number of cases, this was their first involvement with the United States government. They had, did not have security clearances when they were hired or brought onto the commission, but it was a group of very, very extraordinary Uh, people. Uh, Warren Bass, who had a PhD from Columbia University in history. Uh, Scott Allen, who was a young lawyer, but who had worked very closely with Richard Holbrook, the architect of the Dayton Peace Agreements on Bosnia. And, And Scott had done work such as devising new theories for prosecuting war criminals in in The Hague for the criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So really interesting things like that. Bonnie Jenkins had a background. She was a Navy Reserve officer. She was pursuing a PhD at the time. She was also a lawyer. Bonnie has gone on, incidentally, to be a a deputy secretary of state, uh, undersecretary of state, actually, which is a very high-ranking position at the State Department. Alexis Albion, who was getting close to earning her PhD from Harvard in history and had a deep and lifelong interest in the history of espionage and U.S. intelligence. All these people had these just incredible backgrounds, and I'm leaving a few folks out, mm-hmm. but but there were others on the team that that made just huge contributions. But it was the first time where they were handling really top-secret classified documents, and it was important that all of that be done according to the rules and that they learned how to protect all of that because, you know, any sort of mishaps or mistakes that we made would have undermined the credibility of the, of the commission and its ability to securely handle all that kind of information. So just kind of walking them through some of those things in the early stage was probably useful to them. And of course, I, I learned a lot from them because they were all so talented in in the field of research and in writing. I I think one of the secrets to being a a manager is that you don't compete with the people that you're managing. You you recognize their brilliance and their abilities and you look for opportunities for them to show that. And you just kind of plow the field in front of them to give them free running field Mm -hmm. to do what they do best. Too many people in Washington in hierarchy of Washington, egos can be pretty big. And, you know, bosses sometimes can be more about their own sort of advancement or whatever than allowing those people that have these talents to shine. And I, I try to, you know, understand that and put that into effect. So you've talked a bit about what Team 3's responsibilities were, but how did that piece of the puzzle sort of fit into the overarching things that the commission was looking at. So where were you in the pantheon of what the commission was all about? That counterterrorism policy investigation touched on so many different parts of the investigation because there were other teams that that were looking at the actual the actual plot, the specific actors in the plot, the foreigners the, that came into our country in some cases up to two years before the 9-11 attacks. Uh, we had teams that were looking at the intelligence community specifically to see 
what reporting had been been done to warn of the threat before the 9-11 attacks. All of that was going on. And I think that we intermixed or we, you know, were paying attention to what the other teams were doing because what we discovered uh, in interviewing the people that we had to interview were so many different aspects of it that could be helpful to those teams as well, too, that were doing terrorism finance, for example, uh, terrorism travel, uh, and looking at those specific aspects. But it also required coordination from our front office, the executive director and deputy executive director, the ones who could see from the the 20,000 foot level and see everything that was going on and, and be able to develop those synergies among the teams. You looked at counterterrorism policy and how the Clinton administration and the George W. Bush administration chose to address the al-Qaeda threat and also the response immediately after 9-11. Wasn't it tempting at times to say they did a good job, they didn't do a good job, and to really comment on that as opposed to just the facts, ma'am, just the facts? I think that's something that had to be instilled in us, and not just us, but in all the teams. Uh, Because, look, everybody has their biases, I suppose, and yet we were dealing with such a, a volatile set of issues, and the public had all kinds of different expectations in us. So we what we did was we followed the lead and the leadership of the, of the co-chairs of the commission who I think understood that that partisanship of any kind had to be left behind. I don't know if it's widely known, but staff members were not brought on board the commission because of political affiliation or anything like that. Now, maybe some had been involved in one way, but that's not why they were brought on board. They were brought on board because they had expertise in an area that the commission needed to investigate or that background that would be important for that investigation. We would like to thank our sponsor, Carnegie Corporation of New York. The Philanthropic Foundation supports innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. Learn more at carnegie.org and the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. In your role on the commission, you had the opportunity to interview some very senior people, such as National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, the Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet, and even former President Clinton. What's it like to sit in the room with these very, very important high-level people and be the one asking them, what were you thinking when you did that? Well, it's a great question. And I, and in those circumstances, there were others from the commission with me, Executive Director Philip Zelico, Chris Kojum, the Deputy Executive Director Dan Marcus, the Senior Counsel. But nonetheless, you're right. You're in this situation where you're sitting across from the president of the United States. And I think it's important when you go into those situations to realize it's not really you. You're not there because of, I'm not, I wasn't there because I'm Mike Hurley, whatever weight that would carry. I was there because I was representing the American people. And when you think about it, it's pretty awe-inspiring because I don't think there are too many systems in the world that, I mean, could you imagine, you know, calling some dictator in front of (laughs) of Vladimir Putin or something like that in front of a panel to ask questions and, you know, make him defend the positions that he had taken and and the decisions that that he had made. We all of us that were in those meetings were asking questions of our leaders, uncomfortable questions, I think, in many respects, Mm -hmm. but they had to answer. And I have to say, for in all those experiences, I felt that most of them, they took it very, very seriously. They were thoughtful, and they provided thoughtful answers. And it was really an extraordinary feeling that we were government employees, but that we're able to, to hold that, that leadership to account. Having been in Afghanistan and working with the people that I worked there, the special operations forces, and our, our Delta Force and SEAL Team 6, not too much intimidates you after that if you're kind of going up against Mm -hmm. al-Qaeda. So uh, 
sitting across from high-level government officials, I had a good deal of respect for them. I had respect for the office that they held. But I also understood that they had an obligation uh, to tell us we were the instrument that was going to convey what we learned to the American people. So I guess that background, I wasn't intimidated by it. So that was that was the first thing. A specific example I remember is when Philip Zelico, the executive director, and I, we went around and we interviewed some pretty high-ranking military people, including combatant commanders. So combatant commanders for our listeners are what used to be commanders in chief of specific of the specific mm-hmm. commands of the, their four star rank. And so in particular we met the former combatant commander of CENTCOM, uh, the Central Command that had the responsibility for Afghanistan and and South Asia and the Middle East. And we met with him. I think that was Anthony Zinni. And we went to, um, where was it, their headquarters in, in Tampa, I think, in Florida, uh, for special operations. And we walk into the meeting, and I hadn't met General Zinni, and a four-star rank is pretty imposing. And, you know, you see the military people, they're all sort of around him. I'm not worthy to be in your presence and that kind of thing. But what happened was one of the persons in the meeting was a, a member of SEAL Team 6 who had been deployed with me in Afghanistan. I didn't know he was going to be there, and I hadn't seen him since I'd been in Afghanistan. And we saw each other and kind of walked up and hugged each other and told a few stories. And he walked over to General Zinni and said, this is Michael Hurley, who was our leader in Afghanistan. And Zinni looked at me and said, you must be okay. And so I guess that background actually helped me in a specific circumstances. And it kind of let some whatever tension was out of the room because he knew I wasn't going to be there to to be unfair, and Zelico wasn't there to be unfair, but to ask questions, and it turned out to be a very productive uh, discussion we had with him. Well, in some ways, you were showing that you were one of them. Yeah. You know, yeah. Th- and that you had that kind of bond and understood the challenges that they had in a way that the average person walking in might not. And, Barbara, I know you've talked about that when you had to investigate for the Department of Justice's inspector general and you had to, you know, have conversations with people in the department and attorneys and so on that you had, they knew you were one of them and that you were going to conduct it by the principles. You didn't have an agenda. Yeah. You know, but one of the challenges when you're doing these investigations, you sort of know the facts. You know, we, we've talked about these investigations as being a puzzle, mm-hmm. but the challenge is that Unlike the normal jigsaw puzzle, you don't have all the pieces, and you don't have that lovely picture that tells you what you're trying to put what together. What you're aiming for. What you're aiming for. And But when you're going to investigate these people, you've got 20-20 hindsight. You now have the picture. How hard is it to fairly ask the questions of people who didn't have the benefit of having the picture? And how do you make sure that you fairly ask questions and get it from the perspective of people who didn't have all the information that you currently have in your head. Part of that, I think, was the example, again, of our of our chairs who, you know, insisted on, on fairness and an honest approach. Part of it also was, you remember, we had a special advisor to the commission, Professor Ernie May from, from Harvard University, who had been on every commission, you know, dating back for decades as an advisor, and Philip Zelico, Ernie May had written a book about, I forget the, I forget the title, but anyway, it was, it was a book where he examined that question of looking at historical problems using hindsight in a kind of an unfair way. And so we had that kind of instilled in us in that example to go in to, we, we would work with each other, my team before interviews, go over each other's questions and, and see, you know, were the questions fair? Were they getting at all the issues? all the things that we need to cover. We wouldn't ask leading questions. Um, You know what leading questions Mm -hmm. are from your law background, questions that, you know, sort of assuming the answer. We wouldn't do that. It was sort of factual questions. One of the things we did was we we created pretty detailed timelines of decision-making. And so you could look at these timelines and find out who was meeting whom when and what was decided at this meeting. And you could just insert things in there. So it was... It was, each one of those was one of those pieces in the jigsaw puzzle. But to your point, I think that we had to be very conscious of 
of not falling into the trap of I- imposing what we knew happened on what was in front of them at the time that they made their decisions. And so you just had to had to be deliberate about that. Given the scope of what Team 3 had to look at, you were looking at some very highly classified, protected secrets that the government had, and legitimate secrets that the government had. And you're used to, as part of your previous jobs, protecting those secrets. But then you had to write a report that was going to go to the American public and be available in any bookstore. I mean, how did you address the challenge of, I need to protect secrets because that's my job, versus I need to let the American people know what happened? So I think you identified it. The underlying current in all of this was to try to tell as complete a story to the American people as we possibly could. And that meant that we had to research all of these highly classified records of the government. And so we would write that and take the facts out of that to tell the story of all the different phases. of. One example is looking at the CIA's covert action programs to capture or kill Osama bin Laden in the couple of years before the 9-11 attacks. And there were seven or eight scenarios that CIA put together and rehearsed for and practiced for uh, to try to make that happen. And all of that is sort of controlled by presidential authorizations that are signed by the President of the United States that authorize an action that might result in the killing of an enemy of the United States. And so highly, highly classified documents, top secret documents, you know, you can imagine that that stuff gets protected and kept in the archives uh, for decades before the public even knows about it. So very sensitive. But we had to write our reports using that. We kind of, from our perspective on our team, we sort of said, okay, that's going to be a problem. We're going to write down what we're discovering, drawing on all these materials so we have a complete story that we can tell. And then that's the problem of our leadership, our executive director, our deputy executive director, and especially the Mm co-chairs of the commission, to figure out how we can get this information declassified in a way so that we can tell the American people when our final report comes out that this is the story. We haven't left anything out to the best of our ability up to this point. And that was a kind of titanic struggle, but it wasn't my team that fought that particular issue. It was the leadership of the commission. So the instructions for my team were to write what happened, draw on all these sensitive materials, and we've got your back. You know, we'll be the ones that get into the trenches to make this happen. And that in itself is a pretty interesting story as well. We would like to thank our sponsor, Carnegie Corporation of New York. The Philanthropic Foundation supports innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. Learn more at Carnegie.org and the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. You mentioned the possibility of targeting and, in fact, possibly killing Um, some of these terrorists who were threatening the United States. That's an extraordinary power. Normally in the United States, we'd have to, you'd have, before you'd make that decision to use that kind of authority, you'd have to have a jury trial and they'd have to be convicted and there'd have to be all these findings. How did that process work in the U.S. government? I, I mean, I'm assuming it's not like Survivor and people just get voted off the island. It's a complex process, and it takes time for it to happen, but the fundamental legal basis for it is that it's widely recognized in international law that a nation has the right to defend itself. So if there's someone out there who is attacking you, and remember, we'd had al-Qaeda attacks in East Africa, two two U.S. embassies simultaneously attacked with U.S. casualties, the attack on the USS Cole, a Navy warship off the coast of Yemen in fall of 2000, attacked by a bomb borne by a small boat, an al-Qaeda terrorist, um, that resulted in the deaths of 17 U.S. sailors, 41 
injured and a half billion dollars to a, to a U.S. warship. That, all those things were acts of war, would have been acts of war by, by a country if they had done it to the U.S. So that's the legal basis for it. You can defend yourself. And so targeting someone who is the ringleader of this, uh, that's, that's sort of the, the, the legal foundation for it. But beyond that, you build the record of what they have done, of the danger that they're posing to the United States. And this is done through what is known as an interagency process. What does that mean? It means all of the agencies that uh, have responsibility for national security, CIA, the Department of Defense, the State Department, and Attorney General's Office, including the principles of those agencies, meaning the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of CIA, the Director of the FBI, they'll get together after this whole process has worked out at the lower levels and basically put in writing to the President of the United States that, you know, we, this group, believe that this person is of such a threat to the United States that he, he warrants lethal action from the United States. And so the President will decide to sign off or not sign off on that. It goes all the way up to the President of the United States. But you're right to to say that's an awesome power, and they get revised. They're not in place for five or ten years. They have to be renewed, I think, every six months or so. And then restrictions are placed on those arms of the U.S. government that are tasked with responsibility of carrying it out. In this case, Osama bin Laden was CIA that that was given that responsibility. So that's essentially the process. It's one that's highly classified. It's used rarely, but certainly in the case of al-Qaeda, it was justified. What's your most vivid memory of your work on the commission that you think the American public should know about? Well, I'm afraid I won't be very original here because I know that some of my commission staff colleagues share this memory. Um, I was lucky enough to be in the room in early July 2004 when the commissioners met to vote on the approving the final version of the 9-11 commission report. Um, I was, I guess, what you would call a backbencher sitting up against the wall, not at the table with the 10 commissioners. I think it was you, Barbara, that described that as experience as sitting, kind of looking through the keyhole of history. And, and that's what I felt as well, too, because it was really an extraordinary moment for all kinds of reasons. But one of them was that the power of the commission's final report was that all the commissioners voted in favor of the report to approve the report. They didn't change one word. There'd been fights all along during the process of approving it, but when the moment of truth came and it was time to, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, they all said yes. But if there had been one dissenter, if there had been one dissenter from that, you can imagine what political hay would have been made out of that, sort of saying, oh, this is a partisan report. But with this show of strength, five Democrats and five Republicans coming together to say, this is the definitive account of our investigation and our recommendations to keep the country safe, it truly was extraordinary. And I felt like I was witnessing literally in real time. I wanted to just somehow freeze it in my memory because even then, we're, we're living through a, a politically polarized time now. But let's remember that in 2004, summer of 2004, we were in the middle of a very contentious presidential election as well. Politics were polarized. And to sort of see this example of the parties coming together, putting country above partisan interests was a pretty extraordinary thing to, to witness. And I wasn't sure I'd ever see it again in my life. And I wanted to just relish it and to, and I've had the good fortune since then of speaking at colleges and universities and civic organizations all around the country. And I usually cite this moment because I know we become very jaded about our politics and that, you know, you can say that we're still capable of this. And that I think is maybe one of the best examples uh, of it. Your team collected a great deal of important information. 
how did you communicate your findings and let the commissioners know what you were finding as well as the significance of what you were finding? So throughout my team's work, uh, we would we would come back or individuals would come back. So we had we had one of our team members, Alexis Albion, spent a lot of time at CIA. And she would come back at the end of the day and be at our office in downtown Washington and share what she had found. So she'd communicate it to us. And if it were significant enough, we would communicate it to the executive director and the deputy executive director. And they would communicate it to the the co-chairs. So there was kind of that, I would say, informal pipeline that Mm -hmm. was taking place that was taking place all the time. Um, sort of like, you won't believe what we found out here. And so we were always looking for that smoking gun, I mm-hmm. guess, as it were. And so there was sort of that method. And the other method was more formal, but we would write these findings down as we wrote these staff statements. And I don't know if listeners know what staff statements are, but they're the statements, the formal statements that a commission investigating a, an important you know, event in U.S. history will present formally to the commissioners in a public hearing um, in advance of that. So it's a formal document. So we would write drafts of this. And so our managers would see those drafts, and that's a form of communication. And then we would go over those in these late night sessions all the time, over every word to try to make them as factual as possible, stripping away Adjectives. I mean, if you look at the 9/11 Commission report, you're gonna not you're not gonna find a lot of adjectives about anybody in that report or any organization. To to make it bare bones in that sense, to write it in as clear English as possible, I think that was another really brilliant bit of guidance from our co-chairs to make our final report readable by average Americans. Mm-hmm. I think we achieved that, Barbara and. It's a very readable document, lengthy, but readable. We had that whole system of communication and the co-chairs and the managers, the executive director, deputy executive director could come back to our offices, review the memos. We had to do a memo on each of the interviews that we did, three, four pages, sometimes longer than that. Those were available. Audio recordings, so we recorded not all of the interviews, but a good number of them. So there are on record and they're at the National Archives now. All of that is a form of communication and that's how we we shared that with uh, with our management. Were there any sort of major findings in the investigation that surprised you? Well, one, and it surprised me and certainly surprised uh, my colleague on my team, Warren Bass, who who also had the responsibility of uh, doing research into the National Security Council's decision-making with respect to al-Qaeda. And we were down at the White House interviewing a woman who was a, um, a director in the counterterrorism a directorate of the NSC staff. In fact, she was working in the office of Richard Clark, who was the kind of unofficially known as the czar of counterterrorism. He was special assistant to the president and senior director for counterterrorism. Anyway, uh, her name was Lisa Gordon Haggerty, and she had expertise in things nuclear. She told us after our questioning of her that on a number of occasions when she'd be driving in from wherever she lived in Maryland to her job at the White House on an early morning that she half expected to see a mushroom cloud over the White House or over Washington, D.C., indicating that there was deep concern among experts that al-Qaeda could have gotten some nuclear materials and was planning that kind of an attack. So that was a pretty shocking revelation and surprise. I'd say that was probably the biggest eye-opener. And of course, we discussed this in the 9-11 Commission report. And then in a more general way, just seeing how this system, national security system that had been set up really following World War II, That was when the architecture was set up. And that during the Cold War had performed pretty well, I would say, in protecting us. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union and when new threats appeared on the horizon, like transnational terrorism, it just didn't seem to be as agile and, you know, as responsive or as quick as that earlier system had been. 
And so it was a surprise in a way to see that those remnants of that system with maybe not the full sharing of information among the agencies that one would have expected. And that was because of reasons that were established during the Cold War and the difference between the FBI, which does law enforcement, and the CIA, which does intelligence gathering. And many other rules and regulations were really established during that er earlier period. And some of them needed to be rehauled, revamped, changed for dealing with a, a much quicker threat that was constantly evolving because we were dealing with sort of microorganizations that could do really great damage to us. The surprise was that that change was not occurring fast enough. That may have been one of the underlying problems that existed that made it difficult for these different agencies to really come to a common view about how serious the al-Qaeda threat was and then marshalling all elements of national power to stamp it out. Your focus on Team 3 was counterterrorism policy. Having done that investigation and made a number of important findings, can you point to any things that are different today because of the work that your team did? Well, there's language in the report that I think flows directly from our work on uh, learning about that al-Qaeda was attempting to get nuclear materials. And most Americans don't that. I talked about that a little bit earlier, that one of the recommendations the commission made, because our commissioners were so struck by what that meant, that there were actually experts in the U.S. government that, that thought that al-Qaeda might have gotten nuclear materials and might have secreted them in some major American city, and you know you can imagine what the consequences of that would have been. The recommendation was, and it's, 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 I think it's very direct language, was the U.S. has to make a priority of keeping the most dangerous weapons in the world out of the hands of the most dangerous people in the world. And I think that flowed from my, in part from my team's work, certainly. So I think that was a, a significant recommendation. When the commission's final report came out, there was a lot of focus on all of that. And the commission, the organization that was set up after the commission to carry on its work to some extent, that organization worked closely with an organization in Washington, D.C. called the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI, that had been dedicated to those kinds of issues. So there was that collaboration. I think that was very good. The other thing that I can think of is that on the policy side, and this partly flowed from our team's work, but Congress was also involved in policy making or should have been involved in policy making. It was largely the executive branch. The commission made a, a strong recommendation that Congress reform its own oversight role. Again, a lot of its committee structure had been set up for an earlier era and it wasn't very well suited for overseeing a newly created department such as the, the Department of Homeland Security, which, and you know this answer better than I do, but I think gathered together 16, 17 separate government agencies and became this rather unwieldy behemoth of a government organization that really required some coherent direction from Congress, but in fact, its, uh, its leaders had to report to, I think, a total of the number of changes, but 100, 112 congressional committees and subcommittees. Now, that's not a recipe for giving it a new organization the kind of help that it needs to carry out its really, really important work. So I think some of that flowed from my team's work. There were a number of recommendations, I think, that you could point to the work of my team as some of the origin of where they came from. The most important thing about the recommendation of reforming Congress is out of the 41 recommendations that the 9-11 Commission made, that's the only recommendation that has not been implemented. Uh, I'm glad you said that. Congress was very happy to you know, reform parts of the executive branch, much less happy or much less interested in making changes that would reduce the power of uh, committee chairs um, and all these representatives are striving to get into those positions. So they didn't want to see a reduction in their power, but that's an astute observation.
Some of our listeners were not born when the United States was attacked on September 11, 2001. What would you say to these younger people about the work of the commission and its potential relevance today, or is it just dusty history? I think the commission is still quite relevant to the world today, but there's a common element these days. There's just kind of being jaded about politics, being jaded about leadership, that Washington doesn't pay attention, that people are just interested in fighting each other in our government. And I can cite the leadership of Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton on the 9-11 Commission to say it's not always like that, that there are examples and fairly recent examples of the kind of leadership that this country needs to get us out of some of the holes that we're in and that, you know, not to lose heart, not to, you know, not to think that it's always going to be this way, that people are able to come together to solve, you know, really, really important problems and that professionals, I, I mean, I have to, I actually have to say that I'm, I'm very distressed by what I've heard you know, across the board at times from people in the country, Americans who, without good evidence, talk about people in government and the federal government being part of some deep state or something like that. My experience has been that people in CIA, in the FBI, in the Department of Justice are dedicated Americans. I've worked with people who have faced dangerous, dangerous situations. They do it for their country. I think that's actually that's actually the norm. And I, I kind of hope that the younger generation understands that and sees government service as something really, really important because we need them. We need them and we're going to need their talents to be in these places. And I don't want them getting turned off by what's happening in terms of the polarization of our politics. I want them to be excited to sort of say that you can make a difference and you can can work with other people who have the same dedication and commitment to keeping our country safe and that we do have these leaders out there. What we need to do is put political leaders who understand that and, you know, ensure that they pick people that have that maturity and vision. There aren't that many Tom Keynes and Lee Hamiltons around, but let's look at it this way. We all on our commission, and I think everybody that they dealt with saw that example and hopefully tried to have some of that as part of how we see things now. Any final thoughts on the moment in American history that we shared together in our work on the 9-11 Commission? Sure. I'd sort of like to preface this by saying that kind of as I look at the world today, and I don't want to paint a bleak landscape here, but there's always going to be a challenge out there for the United States, like a big challenge. There's always going to be another Vladimir Putin who's going to want to invade some innocent nearby country and cause untold suffering to millions. There's going to be disease and more pandemics and all and famine and drought and all these challenges. And we need good people to face that. I think that the 9-11 Commission and its story is an example, a very clear example of when Americans came together in this group that had excellent leadership and did what they had to do, that conducted a very objective fact-finding investigation that had credibility because it was understood to be bipartisan, and therefore that was the power of it. I guess my point is is that we're going to have these kind of challenges in the future. We're never going to get a rest. That's not the way history works. There are going to be other commissions. And going back to your previous question, I hope young people will have the chance to serve on the kind of commission that we served on, Barbara, and that our colleagues did as well, because it's ennobling. And I'll I'll finish with an anecdote that I think you, for reasons that will become clear, will particularly appreciate, that I remember reading a book called um, The Best and Brightest by David Halberstam. It was about the Vietnam conflict. I recommend this to our listeners, by the way. In any event, he describes the the leaders in the Kennedy administration, the cabinet, this constellation of brilliant people. And one of them, more than one of them, were were Rhodes Scholars. The author at Halberstam gives this anecdote about one of them who was in a very powerful position in the government who had been a Rhodes Scholar. 
and sort of told the story about how when this this person was applying for his Rhodes Scholarship 20 years before, 25 years before. And in his Rhodes Scholarship interview to get this honor and, and, and scholarship, he was asked by one of the questioners, what would you like to have, you know, engraved on your tombstone? Interesting question. And without batting an eye, the person said, Rhodes Scholar. And of course, needless to say, he won the Rhodes Scholarship. The reason I raised this is because I just have a hunch that many of us who served on the 9-11 Commission would be honored to have on our epitaphs served on the 9-11 Commission. And I hope that young people in the future have the chance to serve on something like we had because I, speaking just for myself, but it was an extraordinarily fulfilling thing. And I think the relationships that we built and that we're carrying forward are invaluable. This has been a great conversation, Mike. Thanks for sharing your perspectives. My pleasure. Michael and his team's investigation provided the American people much needed answers as to why their government failed in some of its primary responsibilities, keeping the American people safe. His prior experience on the ground fighting al-Qaeda, as well as navigating the halls of the National Security Council, made him an ideal leader for this complex piece of the puzzle. In the next episode of the Are We Safer Today podcast, we'll be hearing from Philip Zelico, the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. Philip's challenge was to create an organization, staff it with highly qualified individuals, develop and implement a strategy to conduct a highly complex investigation into one of the most consequential events in U.S. history. Bush himself didn't want to dodge us. Bush himself, I think, he felt a sense of responsibility for what happened on 9-11 as president, but I think he wanted to talk about this if a way could be found. The interesting aspect of that was that we also wanted to talk to Vice President Cheney, and the, the deal we ended up working out was basically to spend a morning with both Bush and Cheney together at the White House. Philip was essential to the commission's success. He was a key architect of the approach for the investigation and its final report. Join us as we continue to explore through the eyes of the investigators the most extensive investigation in U.S. history. Thank you for listening to the Are We Safer Today podcast. This was made possible thanks to our sponsors, Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Wilson Center. I'm Barbara Gruy. I'm Mike Hurley. This is the Are We Safer Today podcast. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to check out the Are We Safer Today documentary film. In it, the 9-11 commissioners discuss their historic work, what they did and how they did it. Available in broadcast or streaming from your local public television station or pbs.org slash video. Special thanks to the Center on Representative Government at Indiana University, along with Paul and Cindy Simon Scott and the Sumerian Foundation. Are We Safer Today is a production of Naptown Media. Executive producer, Bob Massey. Produced by Shelby Hiltunen with associate producer, Emily Twergle. Editors, Matt Massey and PJ Wilson. Recorded at Interface Media Group in Washington, D.C. with sound engineer, Dennis Jacobson. Thanks to Sarah Jackson and Grant McPollin. Theme music by House Music and Sound.